Hello everyone and welcome. My name is James and this paper is entitled But She to be a Queen and Cruelly Handled as Was Never Seen Anne Boleyn and Her Gentlewoman in the Tower of London. On the 2nd of May 1536, Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife and queen, was arrested on suspicion of committing adultery. Within two weeks of her arrest, Anne stood trial. She was found guilty of treason and was condemned to death. A few days later, on the 19th of May, Anne was taken from her lodgings within the Tower of London to a nearby scaffold, where her head was stricken off with a sword. Anne's fall is a story which has been told many, many times before, though historians have often overlooked or set aside the significance of the personal, emotional or the psychological in favour of a more politically driven narrative. It will become clear that these were in fact inextricable. Whereas previously, the focal question has been if Anne was innocent or guilty of committing adultery. This paper will closely examine Anne's final days in the Tower, reconstructing her experience of loneliness and isolation by focusing more specifically on her relationship with the gentlewoman servants who attended upon her. The surviving source material for the fall of Anne Boleyn is fragmentary. Such records are so tantalisingly inadequate that it is often suggested that many of these documents must have been destroyed. To reconstruct, in three parts, the spatial, the emotional, and the political dimensions of Anne's loneliness and isolation, we rely on the letters written from Sir William Kingston, Constable of the Tower, to Thomas Cromwell, the King's Secretary. These letters can be dated from the 3rd of May 1536, the day after Anne's arrest, to the 19th of May, the day of her execution. What makes these letters so compelling is that they provide us with an insight into Anne's final days. They detail the nature of her day-to-day -day interactions and conversations with her servants, which otherwise would not have been recorded or have survived today. Yet these letters too can be difficult to read and interpret, not least because, like many documents held in the Cotonian Library, these manuscripts were damaged, mutilated, some irreparably, in the fire at Ashburnham House in 1731. Though fortunately, in this instance, prior to the fire, they had been seen and in some measure transcribed by the antiquary John Stripe. Although Kingston was unlikely to misrepresent Anne or deliberately mislead the king, as we shall see, we must be cautious in deciphering from these letters the Queen's own voice, tone or expression, as this could have been distorted, even unconsciously, by the hand of Kingston. If I may begin by considering the spatial dimension of Anne's loneliness and isolation. The chronicler Charles Risley recorded that Anne was arrested on the 2nd of May and escorted to the Tower of London by the King's councillors, who left her there prisoner. There the Queen was to remain in the custody of Sir William Kingston. Kingston had been instructed by the King to record everything that the Queen said in the Tower. The day after her arrest, he reported to Cromwell that, upon the King's council departing from the Tower, he went before the Queen into her lodging. And then she said unto him, Master Kingston, shall I go into a dungeon? To which Kingston replied, No, madame, you shall go into the lodging you lay in at your coronation. The Queen spent seventeen days as a prisoner in the Tower of London before she was executed. For the duration, Anne would occupy the Queen's apartments in the Tower, the same lodgings in which she had stayed awaiting her coronation some three years earlier. As illustrated here in this near-contemporary map of the Tower of London, dating to 1597, Anne's apartments were situated southeast of the White Tower, here on the map marked with an arrow, consisting of a watching chamber, a presence chamber, a privy chamber, a privy closet, and a bedchamber, adorned with rich tapestries and furnishings in a manner befitting her status as queen. Anne did not suffer her final days in a cold, dark, and barren dungeon, cell, or gaol, but a prison was a prison. She could not leave the tower, and in her final days, Anne was likely restricted to her innermost lodgings, her privy chamber, closet and bedchamber. Her outer lodgings constituted the watching chamber and presence chamber, where the Queen would usually host, entertain, and occasionally dine with the King, courtiers and counsellors, or receive foreign ambassadors and dignitaries. But as a prisoner of the Tower, she would not be receiving any visitors. This appears to have concerned Anne, she remarking to Kingston, I have much marvel that the king's counsel comes not to me. She may have hoped in vain for the opportunity to refute the accusations laid against her, 
even requesting that Kingston bear a letter from her to Cromwell, though he refused, stating, Madame, tell it to me by word of mouth, and I will do it. Later, Anne took exception when even Kingston failed to visit her. After supper one evening, he would recall, she sent for him, and at his coming she said, Where have you been all day? And to this Kingston excused himself, saying he had been with other prisoners. Anne was clearly and quite purposefully kept in the dark. On the night of her arrest, she asked Kingston, Do you know wherefore I am here? To which he said, Nay. And then she asked him, When saw you the king? And he said he had not seen him since the tilt yard, the day before her arrest. Anne then urged Kingston, I pray you to tell me where my lord, my father, is. And he told her only that he had seen him before dinner in the court. And finally, Anne sighed, Oh, where is my sweet brother? And he said only that he had left him at York Place. Though Kingston will have known well that Anne's brother George, too, had been arrested and was imprisoned in the tower. Clearly, it was distressing for Anne to be apprehended without warning and escorted to the tower, secluded, now a prisoner confined to her innermost chambers, prohibited from seeing or speaking with the king, her husband, her family, her court, and her kingdom. But she was not alone. During her imprisonment, Anne was attended by four or five gentlewomen servants, and Kingston's letters provide us with some indication as to who these women were. The first was Mary Scrope, the wife of Sir William Kingston. This Lady Boleyn can be identified as Elizabeth Wood, the Queen's aunt, wife of Sir James Boleyn. The Mistress Coffin was Margaret de Moke, wife of Sir William Coffin, gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber and the Queen's Master of the Horse. Kingston also acknowledges that there were at least two other gentlewomen in attendance. Certainly one was Mistress Stoner, likely Isabel, the wife of Sir Walter Stoner, the King's Sergeant at Arms. Unfortunately, there is no record of the identity of the fifth unnamed gentlewoman. As the Queen's servants, these ladies and gentlewomen were appointed to undertake essentially domestic duties, tasks and functions, attending to her personal, intimate and everyday needs, such as dressing and undressing her, washing and bathing, and waiting on her at table, though perhaps not in the elaborate ceremony to which she had been accustomed. As Kingston observed, the Lady Boleyn and Mistress Coffin lay at the Queen's pallet, that is, at the foot of her bed, whereas he and his wife, the Lady Kingston, lay at the door of her privy chamber. Like the constable of the tower, these gentlewomen kept Anne in the dark, as the Queen remarked to Kingston, My Lady Boleyn and Mistress Coffin could tell her nothing of her father, nor nothing else. The Queen's presence chamber no longer served its purpose, but the Queen's privy chamber, where Anne would have retreated and relaxed in private, functioned, as it always did, by restricting access to the Queen. Its attendant staff were responsible too for carefully regulating and controlling this access, previously maintaining and preserving Anne's privacy, but they now enforced it and kept her in isolation. They were effectively her guards. If I may turn now to examine the emotional dimension of Anne's loneliness and isolation in the tower. Kingston's letters provide an almost unprecedented insight into the mental and emotional state of the Queen during her imprisonment. Anne was understandably strained and shaken. On the night of her arrest, she declared, Jesu have mercy on me, for she knelt down weeping a great pace, and in the same sorrow fell into a great laughing as she hath done so many times since. Kingston reiterated that during her imprisonment, at times Anne was merry, and at others she wept, or even laughed uncontrollably. As the constable observed, for one hour she is determined to die, and the next much contrary to that. Later, when Kingston visited her again, Anne said that she had heard that the executioner was very good, and I have a little neck, and she put her hand about it, laughing heartily. I have seen many men and women executed, Kingston reported, all of them in great sorrow, but to my knowledge this lady has much joy and pleasure in death. Perhaps Anne was still in shock. Her outbursts were unpredictable, her state of mind fragile. Was the presence of the four or five gentlewomen servants in the tower with Anne in any way comforting to her, easing her loneliness and isolation? Occasionally the evidence can provide an extraordinary, if brief and anecdotal view of how queens and their servants might have interacted yet more intimately. In these same lodgings three years earlier, 
Anne was served Ipocra and other wines for her coronation, which she sent down to her ladies, and when the ladies had drunk, Anne too withdrew herself with a few of those ladies to relax in her chamber. The evidence, fragmentary as it is, indicates that queens often spoke candidly with their servants. Anne Gainsford, the queen's maid of honour, would later recall that, before her marriage to the king, when her mistress came upon a book of old prophecies in her chambers, she called to her, Come hither, Anne, see here a book of prophecy, illustrating the king, Henry, his first wife, Catherine, mourning and weeping, and Anne herself, with her head off. I would not myself marry him, the maid remarked, before the queen assured her, I am resolved to have him whatsoever might become of me, illustrating that ties of companionship and friendship often amounted to more than the strictest obligations of service. Relationships between mistress and servant, especially in difficult times, could have emotional significance and real depth, as they came to care for each other deeply. For instance, when Anne suffered a miscarriage in 1536, it was surprisingly enough the queen, consoling her maids who wept, assuring them that it was for the best because she would be sooner with child again. Certainly the queen spoke unguardedly with her gentlewomen in the tower. In the first few days of her imprisonment, Anne was manifestly nervous, increasingly anxious, desperately trying to make sense of her fall. She began rehearsing in great detail, if indiscreetly, incidental conversations that took place in her chambers with the gentlemen with whom she was accused. Anne confided in Mistress Coffin that a few days before her arrest, she had asked Henry Norris, a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber, why he did not go through with his marriage, to which he answered, he would tarry a time. The Queen then said incautiously, You look for dead men's shoes, for if out came to the King but good, you would look to have me. Norris, taken aback, said that if he should have any such thought, he would wish his head were off. Later that day she recalled a conversation she had with Francis Weston, another of the king's servants. Anne says that she spoke to Weston because he claimed he did not love his wife, but instead loved Anne's maid, Mistress Shelton. Weston then dared to add that he loved one in her house better than them both. The queen asked, Who is that? It is yourself, Weston said. And then, as Anne recalled, she defied him. In the tower, Anne rehearsed for Mistress Stoner another conversation she had with Mark Smeaton, groom of the king's chamber. The queen had found him standing in the round window in her presence chamber, and asked why he was so sad. He answered that it was no matter. Here, Smeaton's pitiful state must have vexed the queen, as she then said scornfully, You may not look to have me speak to you as I should do a nobleman, because you be an inferior person. To which he replied, panicked, no, no, madame, a look has sufficed me, and thus fare you well. Unfortunately for Anne, her words were reported back to Kingston, and then to Cromwell, substantiating the charges of adultery and treason laid against her in a damning indictment. This evidence would be quite enough to secure a conviction. This raises the question, why did Anne incriminate herself? I turn now to consider, finally, the political dimension of Anne's loneliness and isolation in the Tower. I think much unkindness in the king to put such women about me as I never loved, the queen said to Kingston. But I would have had of mine own privy chamber, which I favour most. Crucially, the gentlewomen who attended upon the queen were chosen by the king, not by Anne herself. More than an unkindness, it was calculated and deliberate. These gentlewomen were the king's spies, as Kingston says, where I was commanded to charge the gentlewomen that give their attendance upon the queen that is to say that they should have no communication with her unless my wife were present. Notwithstanding, it cannot be so, for my Lady Boleyn and Mistress Coffin lie on the Queen's pallet, and I and my wife at the door without. I have everything told to me by Mistress Coffin that she thinks me for you to know, before acknowledging then that the other two gentlewomen lay without him, and requested to know the King's pleasure in the matter. Anne reiterated again days later that the king knew what he did when he put such two women about her as the Lady Boleyn and Mistress Coffin. Kingston assured her that the king took them to be honest and good women, or in other words, that these women could be trusted to watch and inform against her. Politically, Anne was cornered. Cromwell had turned on her, much of her family at court had seemingly abandoned her, and her household, which represented the core of her support, among them those who she did favour most, 
was discharged, and its servants disbanded. She knew herself to be cruelly handled by the king, and yet confessed to, or confided in, women whom she in her own words had never loved. Was it her fragile, nearly hysterical state of mind that saw her unravel, or had the terrifying vulnerability of her position left an otherwise astute queen, desperate, achingly lonely, and incautiously candid? Were these gentlewomen servants merely the king's spies, vipers lying in wait to strike the queen at the slip of her tongue? Certainly her aunt, Elizabeth, Lady Boleyn, was unsympathetic. As Kingston recorded, she said to her niece, Such desire as you have had to such tales has brought you to this. It could even be suggested that these women were guilty of almost baiting Anne into revealing more than she should. Margaret Coffin appears to have eagerly obliged and abided by the instructions of the king. Yet it may be significant that she and the rest of Anne's gentlewomen reported back only that which they thought or felt was necessary. Their interactions, as they survive in these letters, are incomplete, and distorted by the hand of Kingston, recording too only what he felt was pertinent, or in other words, what was political. Nor were Anne's gentlewomen likely to have rehearsed for the constable any interactions in which they had shown her any empathy or compassion. We hear little from Mr. Stoner, for instance, who by this account spoke only a few words in seventeen days, and initially neither she nor the unnamed gentlewoman were chaperoned by Kingston or his wife when they attended to Anne. These women are often characterised as one-dimensional, uncaring and indifferent to Anne's torment in the tower. It was these same women who on the 19th of May accompanied the Queen from her lodgings within the tower to a nearby scaffold. Accounts of Anne's execution vary slightly, but at least three of them record the presence of her gentlewoman. Lancelot de Carl, secretary to the French ambassador residing in England, says that they were half dead themselves, describing them as bereft of their souls, such was their weakness. Mere moments before death, the queen consoled her ladies several times, as one of them, in tears, came forward to do the last office and cover her face with a linen cloth. This last detail is corroborated by an imperial ambassador, who said that Anne knelt down, fastening her clothes about her feet, and one of her ladies bandaged her eyes. Another eyewitness to Anne's execution observed that her gentlewomen then withdrew themselves some little space and knelt down over against the scaffold, bewailing bitterly and shedding many tears. Certainly these heart-wrenching scenes could have been exaggerated. Neither chronicler Edward Hall or Charles Risley can corroborate them, as they did not record the presence of her gentlewomen, though we do know that they were in attendance. Such reports from the scaffold do, however, served to remind us that they were not merely pawns of the king. These women had complex and often overlapping obligations and emotions. Their empathy here needs not be reconciled with their political allegiance. Even the ladies and gentlewomen of her own privy chamber, whom Anne declared she did love and favour most, gave evidence against their mistress. On the 14th of May, Cromwell reported that the Queen's abomination was so rank and common that her ladies of her privy chamber and her chamberers, could not contain it within their breasts. Their intimacy with the Queen and their access to her chambers meant that their testimony carried weight. If Anne was guilty, then her ladies and gentlewomen, willingly or reluctantly, provided statements which condemned their mistress to death. But if Anne was innocent, these servants had turned King's evidence, and it might reasonably be suggested that they did not have a choice. Reconstructing the spatial, emotional, and political dimensions of Anne's experience of loneliness and isolation in the Tower reflects more broadly on how and why a queen, any queen, might experience loneliness even within such an institution as her own household, surrounded by her servants. A queen's privy chamber in itself could be a prison, wherein the king himself appointed its servants, who then facilitated for the queen only the illusion of privacy, feigning an atmosphere of intimacy and trust. Relationships, Interactions within that household were thus crucial. Anne spent 17 days in the tower a prisoner, but she was not alone. Politically, Anne's gentlewomen were necessarily aligned with the king, their sovereign. Yet emotionally, they shared in this most harrowing experience of the queen, and may even have provided their forsaken mistress with genuine emotional comfort in her final days, easing her loneliness and isolation. Thank you.